Cinema show is almost like my dad just like, how many different grooves can I play in 7 8 <laughs> over that same part? You know yeah. what I mean? It's just like a lot of people know my dad as either the Tarzan dude or the dude who did ba 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 ba. Throughout the years, it's just been like such a kind of crazy experience for me as well, and seeing him in a band context when we started rehearsing yeah. with Genesis and being like, oh, you, like you know, being in a band, you're just like, oh, so you're you go through this as well. You're in yeah. a band with with like you know with other people. You're not the boss all the time. Yeah. Man, it's it's. Uh, I was gonna say you're probably so sick of us by now. <laughs> it's been a long few days. Two weeks of straight drumio for Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't want it any other way. Uh, I love it, dude. Welcome here. It's so great to have you here. It's it's yeah. been long overdue. It has. No, thanks for having me. I'm. You know, we've been talking about it for so long. So to finally be here and doing what we've been planning on doing for a while, it's been great. And to any of you out there watching, welcome to Drumio Live. Uh, if you're not familiar with Nick, you're gonna be familiar with him by the end of this lesson. And uh, you may have seen all of this playing out on social media over the past few weeks, but last week we were in Switzerland. Well, we were, um, we were, you know, we sat down with my old man, with my dad, and uh, just talked drumming with him. I got to bother him for two <laughs> days straight, yeah. going through pretty much his whole drumming career, which was, I mean, it's not like, you know, I've always been able to ask him a few things like here and there, but to, you know, have like force him to sit there for two days and just be like, all right, yeah. now let's really get into <laughs> it. Um, it was really great, but yeah, that yeah, was, uh, we did that last week and then we've been here since Sunday, yeah, Saturday? Since Sunday. Okay. Yeah. We're going to be talking about the grooves of Genesis and Nick, obviously you've played 
drums with Genesis yeah. and Phil Collins. Played a lot of grooves. <laughs> Lots of grooves. So we're going to go over a bunch of those. But before we get into the next track, tell us about this kit. Yeah, so this is, um, well, this is a Gretsch USA Custom uh, with the same specs that my dad used, all concert toms. Um, this lovely white finish, um, which is pretty similar to the same kit I was using on his solo tour, uh, the Not Dead Yet tour. The, we did it in white, um, as opposed to the Genesis one, which was like a gray. Um, but yeah, we've got an 8, 10, 12, 15, 16, 18, um, and then a 20 uh, on the kick, which is pretty small for um, you know the music, but that's just what he used. And um, you know, I, it's it's a setup that now I've become used to after playing it for so many years on the road. It's not kind of what I do when I'm back at home with my band, although I do um, throw the two concert toms up whenever yeah. I can. Um, but yeah, sitting back here after not really, you know, obviously preparing for all this, I, I was able to set my kind of old, you know, black concert tom kit back up. But sitting behind it and you know kind of playing extensively for long periods of time on this is kind of like took a little bit of getting used to yeah because um, it was really all you know only something I used on the road to kind of really achieve that sound but yeah concert toms um, on all the toms because that's just part of the sound like so much of uh, some of the iconic fills and and just the sound of the drums just really came down to, to to the drums themselves and knowing how to approach those concert toms and some of the you know the sounds on songs like in the air or mama or those kind of big drum songs, it's all like so much is being carried by the kit itself. Yeah, I know the, <laughs> I was told to do this and I'm gonna do it. The guys in the studio have all the gated, compressed room mics mm -hmm. ready to go. They're very specific about I, the wording. I think that. I got that right. So, <laughs> nice. <laughs> so for everyone out there, can you just play the fill and we're gonna play, actually let's do this first with no gated, compressed room mics and then we'll dial it up after. Cool. And I think when we heard that yesterday, even without the gated compressed room mics, it was pretty solid. But oh, when, yeah. when they're on, it's a whole different animal. So let's hear that. So I can't really tell the difference because I've just got a direct drum mix, but I'm sure you guys are hearing <laughs> all those, all of that in all its glory. I'm sure we'll see it in the chat if everyone, if anyone noticed the difference. But um, yeah, we filmed a bunch of stuff, and we go like deep into that, and we actually talked to your dad even about that song and mm -hmm. figured out the right way to play it, which you just did. Yeah, well, <laughs> thank I've God been, I did it now. I've been playing it wrong my whole life. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I couldn't quite remember exactly how I did it on the road, but we kind of spoke about it. My instinct going back to it and playing it for the first time in a few years, because like, I, you know, I don't go and play that song in my free time. I'm kind of. Are you, you sure? Know, I've been. I, it's, it's, it's. I've played it enough times where I don't need that, but. When I first approached it, I, I added that extra kick in between the last two floor toms, um, and then when we told my, you know, when we asked my dad within a second, he was just like, "Nope, that's that's not the right way yeah. to play it." And it's just like, well, I would have appreciated that after, you know, before we did a tour for two and a half years or something yeah. where I played it every night. So unfortunately, we will not be giving refunds to everybody who showed up to the tour because I played the fill wrong. So <laughs> sorry. You got to live with it. Yeah. Uh, I love it. So right now, before we get into some grooves, we're going to play the keyboard solo from the cinema show. And which version is this from? We're doing the seconds out version. On tour, we were doing uh, kind of an abbreviated version, which uh, was kind of part of a, a medley. And it was kind of the version they were doing really from the 80s onwards. But we went back to the seconds out version where it's kind of got the full keyboard solo. And uh, yeah, live nice. version though. Sweet. Uh, yeah, let's load it up.
Nice work, man. Thank you. We didn't uh, we didn't mention the song name that we uh, Nick played off the top. But that was Duke's intro, and that I believe was the 2007 Live Over Europe version. Yeah. And then this was uh, the cinema show from Seconds Out. Crazy uh, prog masterpieces, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> nice, man. Uh, so let's get into some grooves. Yeah, I need to lie down after that. I know. <laughs> Let me know if you need a towel, too. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay at the moment. We'll see. Um, so we're going to go through a bunch of grooves in this lesson. And Genesis, I mean, your dad created so many legendary parts that drummers have been trying to replicate for decades. Um, and we're just going to go through a bunch of them. So the first one we're going to look at is the opening ride cymbal groove in Behind the Lines, which was, I guess, part of Duke's intro. Yeah, so I will, I'll, I'll start with um, the ride pattern, do that for a few bars, and I'll move it over to the tom. Yeah, cool. Because it's that same, same beat, so okay. I remember watching, uh, there was an interview with Chester a few years ago, and he talked about when he was trying to learn your dad's parts, getting like the, the time happening over here while playing the fills in the left hand was like one of the hardest parts. Yeah, that took a little bit of getting used to with that song specifically. I mean, I was lucky that obviously like as a kid, that live album, the 2007 one was kind of in the rotation of stuff I was listening to. So it wasn't like, I knew what it was supposed to sound like, but actually getting it right, because you're kind of doing a... Like, you're not really finishing it, you're just doing bump, bump, bump. Yeah. Um, but what, what you're doing with the other kind of limbs is kind of filling up that extra space. So it was tricky to kind of get that. I mean, he was specific that it was on the 10, because I was oh, doing really? it on the 12 at one point. It's like, <laughs> no, dude. A classic drummer. <laughs> yeah. Like, very specific about it. But yeah, that was kind of something that um, took a little bit of getting used to. But it's also kind of now, after so long of, of playing that, that, I mean, obviously playing on tour with, with the guys, but also just playing that song and rehearsals and everything just kind of becomes second nature at this point. The next one we have is the verse groove from In the Cage. I know there's a bunch of people in the chat who are saying, you got to play something from the lamb. <laughs> so you're in luck. <laughs> well, yeah, we're, we're, we'll break down the groove. We've obviously, you know, shot quite a few songs. Well, a couple of songs for, for the course that we've been shooting. Um, so with this song, I, I remember when we, when we were shooting it, I really specified that for this, like, I always loved the way Chester played this. Um, don't tell my dad, I kind of preferred the way Chester did it. Oof, I know, hot take, man. man. Hot take. <laughs> no, I, it's not, not so much for the playing, it was more for the energy of the song, because mm -hmm. like, as I, you know, as I said, growing up and listening to the 2007 live album, and then, you know, some of the older stuff, like, that medley would just, you know, that song just became this rocker. Yeah. And I remember speaking to Tony Banks, actually, and him being like, yeah, like, when I wrote the keyboard part, that's kind of what he envisioned is like mm. this whole thing. So when it kind of was played in the 80s, it kind of took on a life of its own. Um, but that song starts, you know, with like a kick pattern that's just... Um, and then the hi-hat comes in. My dad played a little something that was um, like on the hi-hat instead of, which is kind of almost like a three against two thing. He was just going. With, with a few more open hi-hats in it. Um, yeah. But obviously for the sake that we played along to the three sides live version, uh, which is, you know, always, to me what it was, it was just like whatever they ended up doing within the cage, I would just love it. Whether it was whatever medley and whatever songs they decided to add after that, I always just loved it in a live context. And then, mm. you know, having my dad come back behind the kit for the, whatever they were doing next in the medley, whether that was cinema show or in that quiet earth or whatever it was, I, as a kid, that was like really my first introduction to like real kind of prog music. Mm. Can you, uh, just the part where you come in with 
uh, four on the floor with the tom. Can you just break that down a little bit slower? Okay. So obviously the four on the four on the floor is kind of keeping that steady time going, and, and I don't really know if that was something that was mainly added live, because um, obviously on some of the older records it's hard to really decipher exactly what's going on. Um, but I found that opening the hi hat obviously for that accent allowed a bit more, like allowed it not to feel weird when you're not hitting the hi hat. So opening the hi hat kind of lets you gives you a little bit of slack to get back to it to keep that time going without it feeling kind of weird. Yeah. I, I find it cool how like that song. There's like a distinct feel change where it goes from buh, da 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 yeah. da, and then when the four on the floor comes in, it's like whoa. Yeah, everything yeah. And, then, and then changes. when the groove, I mean, on live version, when the groove starts to kick in for real, it's like, I mean, one two three, one two three, one two. But it's this kind of. I always loved how the snare just kind of almost turns the beat for a little yeah. bit and then it comes right back and feels normal. It just, to me, it just, I love the way it just drives that song forward. Totally. Uh, one other thing we haven't talked about yet, just in terms of concert toms, is how do you actually approach a concert tom? Because a lot of people get this wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously it depends on the song. I mean, with some songs that we were doing uh, for some of the older stuff, which was recorded on a, on a double-headed kit, you know, you do approach some of them as, as real toms, but for the most part, to get that kind of classic uh, concert tom sound, you know, you just really gotta smack the hell out of the drums. Like, it's, it's, it's to really get that bark, especially on the eight and 10. I mean, obviously, once you get to the 12 down, you play them a bit more like toms. I mean, depending on the song, because something like In the Air, you're borderline just doing rim shots the whole yeah. time to really get that snap and bark, because the concert tom allows for almost like a lack of resonance and just pure attack. Um, so like when you're doing you know uh, something on the concert times, you're not just going. It's, you just really got to lay into it to really get that, you know, bark that they kind of natural that that they give. And I remember my dad specifically being like he wanted his concert times to sound like just you know a dying seal or something, just like yeah. art, art, like that the whole time. And um, and when I asked him like one time like Dad, how do you how do you tune? Your concert tom. It's like I don't tune them. I just hit them harder, <laughs> and 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 so you do actually. You you get a little bit more life out of the heads because as soon as you start to hear that really terrible kind of ring, That's the perfect. more you smack it, the more you smack it, the more you can kind of get away with it. Yeah, I I, I think I remember when we asked him why he played them. He's like, oh, because they're louder. Yeah, or something. Like. I mean, I gotta be like. There was a few times where I did a, a drum duet. Uh, we did some charity shows, and like obviously front of house, they're they're mixing everything, but. Just from side stage, I remember some people just being like, I can't hear anything the other drummers are doing <laughs> because your drum set's just so loud. Yeah. Um, which, you know, I was like, great. <laughs> like, this is, you so know, nice. Good. Yeah, awesome. Uh, let's jump to the next one. This is another one for all the, the huge prog fans out there from Wind and Wuthering. This is uh, Watt Gorilla. Yeah, so the groove, uh, a little something like this. And obviously that moves over to the ride, little. So I found that with with some of my some of my dad's like older prog stuff, man, the ghost notes and the doubles on the kick are so vital to the groove because you could just play. But having those little ghost notes in between and those doubles completely change the just the vibe and the feel. And it's something I've kind of taken and used on some of like my band songs. You know, you hear that like little double in between, it just totally changes and adds a bit more depth to the groove. So slow down a little bit.
And that almost sounds like kind of like a, like kind of like a John Bonham, Led Zeppelin kind of, you know, yeah. almost like the crunch or something like that. But totally. It's, you know, it's, what you're doing in between the notes is almost just as important as like, you know, the notes themselves, you know? And I guess around like this time with Brand X and I think he said this tune was like Weather Report inspired or something. Like yeah. that makes a lot of sense with, I mean, it's like a fusion groove. Oh yeah, I mean, basically. a lot of that stuff, like, I mean, obviously Brand X is, you know, I mean, don't want to kind of label them as a fusion, yeah. band, but they heavily influenced by that. But yeah, all the wind and weathering stuff, I mean, even some of the stuff on, on Trigger the Tell well as well, but I think on wind and weathering specifically, which I feel is kind of like an underrated record of theirs. It's one of my favorites because the drumming on that is so different to all of like the other stuff they did. Yeah. It's very kind of intricate, but like the vibe, I mean, you also, some of the songs, they got a bit darker. Like, yeah. we, I mean, we talked about In That Quiet Earth where it's like, you know, almost like a cashmere kind of vibe totally. on it, you know? Yeah. Uh, let's jump to, this is an older one, Watcher of the Skies from Foxtrot. Yeah, so this one, to me, like, do, you know, practicing rudiments and having some sort of, uh, you know, consistency and ability on, you know, your, um, on my left hand. Well, it's like whatever hand that isn't your dominant one. I mean, for my dad, it was his right. Um, because you're playing kind of a syncopated pattern throughout the whole thing, and the pattern is... And so you throw the kick in and it's Kind of in six is kind of how I like to think about it, but to be honest, like the time signature kind of doesn't matter. What matters is the pattern. Yeah. Like I just, you just almost ingrain that and start it off like on the snare alone and like with both hands. So you just kind of get a feel for what it's supposed to sound like. And then obviously from there, practicing it with each hand. And then from there, obviously getting it onto the ride. And pretty much that whole song is based around that same pattern. Yeah, and I guess for this one, you talked a lot about this, using the riff to kind of, like the time signature doesn't matter. It's all about like, wh what's that riff that you're grabbing onto? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the bass. The bass and drums kind of are, are really what are defining that kind of hook throughout. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's all over that song from the verse to even like some of the small fills in between, they just all revolve around that same riff, which I found really helpful to understand because there's some of the fills where I would just like confuse as to how they were going back into it, but it's all based around parts of that same pattern. And I mean, it's a kind of consistent theme throughout most of the Genesis so uh, songs and material is that a lot of the odd time, um, I mean, we've kind of, you know, by ourselves had chats about it, but like, you know, I think there's a lot of bands where they're doing stuff in odd time, but it's just, it feels like odd time. But I think a yeah. good thing about, you know, bands like Genesis, bands like Rush, bands like Tool, like I'm just naming just progressive bands. A lot of their odd time is just based around like a hook and a riff that, that just makes sense. So for songs like this, it's, you know, once you kind of have that, it's a bit easier to grasp than, than other stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, let, we're going to do one more and then we'll play another track. Okay. Uh, next is Duke's Travels, the Tom Groove. Yeah, so the Tom Groove, it's, it's you know, I would guess it's, it's in six. Um, but it's based around kind of a, uh, a Tom Groove, but then you can kind of expand it and, you know, do different stuff with a kick. But it sounds something like this. And then obviously, you know, he starts, like, I think a lot of it was live, and I mean, we kind of talked about a lot of my dad's drumming, to me, it was just very expressive. Hmm. And that's why I always think that one of the biggest things about teaching Genesis stuff and, and the way I approached it is, like, some of these songs aren't meant to, you know, be precisely like the record. It's supposed to just be really about, you know, staying consistent to one thing, but obviously expressing yourself in between. So he would kind of... What he was doing on the kick and some of the, the patterns kind of were changed where maybe it was. You know, yeah. just playing.
playing around it, um, but if we slow it down, um, obviously the kick, I think, kind of builds. I mean, to me, the core, the important part of what the kick is doing is on that kind of, you know, that main boom, boom, yeah. boom, boom. That's kind of where the important part is. So if we slow it down, From there, you can, you know, I, I chose to kind of throw it in a little bit more just to keep that kind of groove going. Because obviously, on a record, it's different to when you're playing it live where you kind of want that steady kind of feel and steady groove. So, you know, adding it in between um, on some of the kind of descending tom bits. Yeah. Nice, man. That's like one of my favorite grooves. I remember the first time I heard that. It sounds like there's like three drummers on there. There's probably yeah. a bunch of overdubs and stuff. Yeah, but. I mean, I think they had fun with that too. I mean, obviously there's the, the groove afterwards, which is a bit more kind of straightforward, but like we talked about the, cons like, you know, having to stay consistent and keep it going. The part where it's, you know, That, that just comes with just, you know, because that can get tiring after the amount of time like that it's <laughs> yeah. going on. I mean, there's a great bit in one of the documentaries where my dad just like is losing, losing it completely at the fact that he can't play like, you know, that consistently because, yeah. you know, it's that one kind of requires a little bit to, to kind of keep that bounce going. Um, when especially when you can't ground yourself on the downbeat, it's all like the offbeats. Yeah, literally. The, yeah. the thing that's keeping the downbeat is, is the snare. Yeah. And... Um, that's why, especially when you're kind of throwing in fills, there is a little bit of a readjustment that kind of needs to happen. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fun groove though, for the most part. Awesome, man. Uh, we got another track. We're gonna do one that you, I guess you didn't get to play on the last Domino tour. No, we, well, we did the first half. We did the part without the drums. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, um, it was part of a medley. Um, but we never get to, we got to, we never got to do the instrumental bit. But it's it's one of my favorite kind of all time Genesis bits. Nice. This is uh, the instrumental from Fading Lights by Genesis.
Nice, man. Thank you. Yeah, I, that, that was, love that song. I'm still mad that we didn't get to play it live. I mean, it's, it's almost well, like. At least you get to do it here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was, uh, was going to say what you, you talked about in the interview last week that I guess this was the last song your dad recorded on a studio album. Yeah, well, it's, it's the, well, I don't know what order they actually tracked it in, but on, I mean, he, he left Genesis in 93 or something like that. Like, basically, We Can Dance was the last album he was on, and this is the last song on that album. So it's a really kind of emotional, obviously, musical bit, but if you listen to the lyrics, it, like, I, I had to ask Tony when we went on tour because it almost sounds like the last song, like, y if you listen to the lyrics, and I remember listening to the first time, I was like, dude, did, did, these, did these guys know what they were doing? <laughs> and I asked Tony, I'm like, because he wrote the lyrics, I was like, did you, I mean, was that intentional? And he was like, a little bit. <laughs> he's, like, <laughs> he's like, because if your dad hadn't left after Invisible Touch, I was kind of sure he was going to leave after this one. <laughs> um, there you have it. <laughs> but, but no, I mean, it's a, it's a really beautiful song, and, and it's kind of poetic that it was kind of the last one. Um, you know, great lyrics and, and just a great kind of overall song. Which would have been great to do on the last domino, but you can't you can't play all the songs. You exactly. Know what I mean? That's literally what we ran into this week. Is yeah. What did we get to? Like thirty songs, and it's like, should we go to forty? Should we? <laughs> yeah, I was like, no, please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just put Nick through the ringer. Uh, for anyone wondering, that was the the way we walk. Yeah, version. the ninety two. I mean, a lot of the the versions, obviously, preparing for going on tour, I I would kind of have to study the live version. Excuse me, f study the live versions. Um, and I just, I, I mean, obviously the record version, I, the drum sound is great, but there's a few fills that you could hear a bit more on the live version, yeah. which is why I kind of chose to do that one. Nice. Well, we're going to get into a few more grooves, and then we have two more tracks we're going to do at the end of the lesson. So the first one, <laughs> this, this is going to put you through the ringer, but I know you're here for it. Los Endos. <laughs> no, I, this is another one that we kind of prepared um, it was in the running to, to not be on the, the final set list, but in the rehearsals, to take it to rehearsals. Um, but yeah, there's so many songs that we never actually got to rehearse it, despite me kind of learning most of it. Um, so yeah, the groove, to me, sounds a little something like this. That's a tough groove. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 hard. I mean, obviously, there it grows throughout the song, and that's a song that's got just so many different uh, like structure and feel changes. I'm dreading the fact that you're going to ask me to play it slow because after all, I, you I won't make you play it too slow. <laughs> <laughs> because last when we were shooting it, that took me eight, that took me longer to do it slowly. You than don't it have to do that one slow because I don't know if anyone else could even do yeah, it slow. Let me. Let, I'll give it a go, and we'll see. It's that simple. There you go. That's, you just that's, nailed it. First that's try. Good, that's as good as it's going to get. And <laughs> please don't ask me to do it again. <laughs> that's awesome. And that one was like, I think your dad said that was inspired by a Santana tune. Yeah, I mean, you can totally, totally get the, the kind of Latin influence in it. The, the kind of bell pattern, the um, just the kind of, I mean, obviously the song title, Los Endos, is clearly Latin inspired. But, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really different to a lot of the Genesis stuff. Um, I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun to play, but it's a real kind of challenge. To, to, to me, it was more just knowing the structure and the different parts that just happened because they just, there's so much going on throughout that song. But what I really loved about it is that if you listen to Trick of the Tail kind of in its, an entire, in its entirety, a lot of those fills and those parts are on Los Endos. You've mm -hmm. got the Dance on a Volcano fill, you've got the, um, the kind of squonk outro. So I really love that just on a songwriter's perspective of like yeah. the fact that they brought it all back for the last song on that album. Totally. Um, yeah, that one's just like a classic for drummers. I know I'm gonna go home and try to learn that because <laughs> now someone's actually here to teach it. So <laughs> that's great, man. Uh, next up, we have another prog masterpiece in that quiet earth. Yeah. So this one is uh, 
It depends how you want to count it. I count it in nine, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It may be easier to just be one, two, three, one, two, three. But the groove is like this. And that's one that I found that the drum part almost dictates the time signature. Mm. Like I never really thought about the time signature, I just knew the drum part. And again, we kind of talked about those kick drum doubles yeah. in between to add a bit more context and, uh, and depth to the groove. What I love about this song is the drum part is so busy, but the melody over top is almost, it's super simple, right? Yeah. Da, da, da. Yeah. But underneath it's the drums are just ripping. Yeah, so. and, then, and then obviously, like, you know, the fills and everything are just blazing throughout. And then all of a sudden does this change where it goes into like a cashmere almost vibe um, and the drum parts like almost pretty much when the levee breaks. Um, and I thought that was really cool to hear because, you know, I know that Zeppelin was a big influence, well, Bonham specifically was a big influence on my dad. Um, and you could kind of tell like on that song that was kind of what the vibe they were going for. Um, and it's just really cool to kind of talk to him about the influence that you know, because a lot of bands you speak to, or people you speak to, and, and they're inspired by musicians or bands before their time. Yeah. So to see a band inspired by a current band was kind of really cool. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to hear, you know, stories about who inspired my dad is, is always kind of fun to me after, you know, my own kind of drum heroes also being some of my dad's drum heroes, you know? Yeah. Funny story, I remember you said last week, you're like, yeah, I have concert toms on my kit because of because Taylor Hawkins played concert toms. <laughs> Your dad had concert toms. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a different kind of context. Like, like for this kid, obviously, it's like signature Phil Collins. Yeah. But, but I, you know, I remember when, um, like, I first got into the Foo Fighters, and I remember it was um, we were, I was with my dad at some point, like, uh, you know, we were at a hotel or something, and and he had actually got an email from Taylor. And it was, you know, just checking in and basically saying, like, I'll keep rocking the concert toms for you, man. And I was like, what? And yeah. so, like, I went, I went and checked it out, and I saw him use a double-headed kit, almost like a bottom setup, with the two concert toms, or however mm -hmm. many he's kept adding. And that's, even now, like, a huge inspiration to how I set up my kit when I'm back home. Um, and obviously, Taylor being such a big deal to me, and such a hero to me, and seeing my dad almost kind of be a hero to him was this just really cool moment. Um, and so, that, you know, the times where we were, were talking, kind of nerd out about everything was just kind of surreal to me. Yeah, I love that. I figured I'd have to wear the, the Taylor Hawkins yeah. <laughs> shirt just to, you know, we're talking about it. So mm -hmm. rest in peace, Taylor. Um, let's move on to, uh, this is a, another one. Supper's Ready, Apocalypse in 9-8. Yeah, so that's, that's a big one. Um, as far as like the core groove, um, this was another one that we spoke about where it's just the riff. And I remember when this was another one that was kind of spoken about being in the set. I mean, it never got taken to rehearsals and we did a lot, I mean, because of COVID, we did so many legs of rehearsals. Yeah. We almost did more legs of rehearsals than we did of the tour itself. <laughs> um, but in, before we did our first rehearsals in New York in like January of 2020, there was talk that, you know, Supper's Ready could be in the running. Um, and I remember asking my dad how he approached it because it was so, you know, so crazy to me. And he just said, stick with the riff. The riff is really what defines that part. The dump, dump, da dum ba dum bum bum ba dum bum ba dum ba dum So on the record, he plays, you know, the core groove is something like this. Now, excuse me if that was a bit fast. My adrenaline is kind of pumping through, so it's I can't... A, it's the seconds out version. So yeah, I can't really gauge the speed right now. I'm just kind of like, <laughs> I'm just so excited to be here, I man. love it. Um, but then there's the, then like on the seconds out version, I believe it's Chester playing it. Um, and it's a stripped back version just because obviously it then became a two drummer thing. And my yeah. dad, you know, would kind of accent what Tony Banks was doing on the keyboards, which is it's a whole kind of, that's a whole lesson in itself is how you know, accessing that keyboard part that is partially in 9-8, partially in 4-4, partially in whatever time signature, but 
having to balance those two different grooves at the same time. So obviously a more stripped back version where you're just really highlighting the riff is And then you can, with that, you can kind of start to improvise around it because, you know, uh, that was also something we spoke about with my dad is like that whole Supper's Ready drum track is complete improvisation the whole time. Um, and I remember, you know, that was something that was, uh, you know, really annoying to me because I'm like, I'm supposed to learn your improvisation. Exactly. And he was like, <laughs> no, like you're just supposed to play around it and find the ways that you're, you know, that you're supposed to you know, where, where the kind of one is or what the keyboards are doing. So, you know, once you kind of have that, there's, it's easier to kind of throw around and improvise, you know. You know, that's just briefly me playing around and just kind of doing different stuff around that same groove and remembering the riff, knowing the riff, and, and kind of that, in a way, the kind of riff almost acts as the drummer in that song mm -hmm. and keeping that time. So just, you know, if you kind of lose it, you just kind of fall back into the riff and know where it is. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, that was a big one to, to kind of tackle. Nice. I know for any of our Drumeo students out there, we have all of Supper's Ready transcribed, so you can actually see what Phil played on that track, but yeah, it was totally improvised. So, uh, good luck memorizing it, <laughs> as yeah. Nick can attest to. Yeah, I, I, I chose not to. <laughs> like, that, I was just like, no. Good call. Yeah. Um, nice. Let's move on to. You actually performed this one, uh, the second track you did, the Cinema Show, uh, the seven eight groove that you played. Yeah. So this, to me, it's just like a bunch of different seven eight grooves, and um, this was kind of my first introduction to seven eight, and it's kind of a fairly kind of natural time signature if you kind of have a riff that's dictating it. I mean, throughout Cinema Show, you've got the jump, 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 jump. So that kind of naturally is in 7-8. Is in um, but there's a few grooves. Um, I think one of the, the more distinct ones is, the, is this one. Then from there, there's you know there's different ways to play it. Obviously, there's the kind of more straightforward, which is just, and then you can go. to play that and that was to me cinema show is almost like my dad just like how many different grooves can I play in seven eight <laughs> over that same part you know yeah. what I mean um, and yeah I mean it, that that just that song was kind of what made seven eight somewhat feel natural to me I've ripped off those grooves plenty times with yeah. my own band you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and you've only been caught a few times <laughs> yeah only a few <laughs> nice one more I didn't even tell you I was gonna add this but I'm gonna add it the uh, the Chester fill. You, okay. play, you play that on Duke's intro, and I know a lot of people want to know what that is. Yeah, so, I mean, the backstory to that is that when Chester joined Genesis, um, obviously he had done some stuff with Zappa before. Um, I think he'd also done some stuff with Weather Report, but the first thing my dad asked him uh, when he joined was to teach him that fill, because he just loved it so much. It's a fill that was kind of thrown all over a bunch of Genesis songs and Phil Collins songs. Um, obviously Duke, it's a faster version. And then on Afterglow, you hear it um, obviously a bit slower. But the core thing is, I mean, I'll play it slowly first and then we'll kind of speed it up. And I'm adding, I'm adding those extra little uh, rolls just to round out um, the bar but obviously on Duke it's a bit shorter, but just one more time slowly. And then obviously Duke tempo, it's. 
and then right back into it. So. But that's a fill that can be used fast to just kind of blaze through it or something that can be used slower on something like Afterglow where it's I mean, obviously on Afterglow, it was actually, they almost used it as a call and response between the drummers where it was like Chester, my dad, like obviously when I was by myself on tour, I had to kind of do the kick drum yeah. to kind of compensate for it. Um, so would they have done the kicks in between when they were doing double drums? I'm not, I'm not so sure if maybe they were doing kicks on the other person's uh, groove or if they were just kind of like keeping out and just letting, because obviously through the mix, it would have just yeah. sounded equal. Uh, where somebody was just going daga and the other person do so daga do good daga do good daga do good gaga gaga like you know yeah that's that's you know obviously became a staple in Genesis shows is the double drummer thing so obviously me tackling it as just me <laughs> was a bit daunting you <laughs> yeah know? I mean, that's a like, lot. even on cinema show like the way I played it uh, there's one part near the end of da 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 I'm doing it with the with the kick and the snare and obviously we on tour we had um one of our backing singers, Daniel, who was doing uh, the timbali to kind of act yep. as the call and, call and response. But on tour, it was just both Chester and my dad hitting the snare drum each. So creating this really cool kind of, you know, kind yeah. of back and forth thing. I know a lot of like, a lot of like modern like players who are playing pop music and stuff that we bring in, they talk a lot about how they have to take drum machine parts and all this production and turn it into a, a real drum kit part. But for you, you're like converting double drum parts into single drum parts. Yeah. So. And it depends. I mean, some songs are easier to tackle than some other ones. I mean, like when I was thinking, when, when we were talking about doing Supper's Ready, I was just dreading the fact that I had to do that like by myself. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? It just became such a staple. I mean, obviously my dad did it by himself when Peter was singing, but obviously when we were playing it, I had to, look at like the most recent live version throughout everything. I mean, that's why the cinema show version we did was a bit abbreviated. Firth of Fifth was the way it was because, yeah. you know, you're learning the most recent live version because that's what the, the band is used yeah. to. And you want them to feel as comfortable as, as possible. You don't want to be kind of uh, a burden or, you know, you know, oh, here, here Nick goes with another one of those films. Let's <laughs> hope he gets it right. Like, yeah. you didn't want that. You want it to be relied upon so that they could be comfortable. And um, if there was a hiccup, they were able to fall back on it because I made it somewhat easier for them to find it, um, which never really happened, but just the few times that it did, I wanted to make sure that I could be as reliable as possible. Yeah, awesome. Uh, we've got one more groove, and some people in the chat have been saying, when is he gonna play the Simmons kit on the left? So we're gonna do one groove, uh, second home by the sea. Okay, so we're swapping over to the Simmons? Let's swap over. Okay, by the way, I didn't know Simmons felt like this. I'd never played a Simmons kit, and I assumed they felt like practice pads or something. You know. That's not the case. Yeah, <laughs> terrible for yours. It's like hitting like a table. It's like it's a, just, a marble countertop is like the best I could think oh of. Oh my God, like a play, we, we, we tracked some of this this morning and it was just like, just <laughs> so excited for it to be over, when <laughs> yeah. I, you know, because it just destroys your wrist. But anyway, the ho second home by the sea groove. And um, obviously on tour, we were using that with triggers. So I was able to play the real drums with a blended kind of Simmons sound in it. Way easier to play, obviously, because it's real drums. But that's something that my dad started doing from, I think, like 92 onwards, um, was just using those same Simmons uh, sounds, but triggering them through the real drums. And that's something that we did kind of all over the last Domino tour was trying to get some of the iconic sounds from like the record, whether it be Invisible Touch, Domino, uh, home by the Sea, even some kind of the classic uh, gated concert tom sounds on like Mama or something like that. But if I slow this groove down, uh, sounds some eh, sounds a little something like this. So there you have the Simmons kit. Nice. 
Yeah, and Nick did a whole, I think you did two playthroughs. Uh, I think it was Invisible Touch and Second Home by the Sea. Yeah, so we, we, we obviously, we dubbed um, Invisible Touch on top of the real drums. Yeah. Just to get that kind of fill. And then Home by the Sea, we just did full out to kind yeah. of blend in with the real drums as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm glad we did those playthroughs and I don't have to do them again because it's just like <laughs> such a, like, I mean, like, I remember my, my dad talking about it and I didn't understand really what he was saying. I mean, he said this last week. He's like, yeah, I mean, like, I really laid into those Simmons drums and it couldn't have been good for my wrist. I was like, I was like, yeah. a practice pad, whatever. Like, then I showed up, I was like, oh, yeah, I, I hit it like twice and my hands yeah. were, you know, sh the shock through your fingers. You can literally feel it just going up your wrist. Oh, yeah, it's and terrible. Your dad had like pads up here. Like, he probably had like eight different pads. Yeah, I mean, he really kind of played into it. I mean, obviously, we've got. Um, you know, the four, I mean, obviously five, including the kick drum, but we kind of fitted it into this kind of big kit. Um, but he obviously had a bit more space. So the way he was playing it, it was just, you know, he was really laying into the Simmons drums and he had like so many. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, it's a kind of a cool, like distinct sound from the eighties, you know, that, so it was cool to be able to trigger those and replicate them live. Yeah. Nice, man. Uh, so we have two more tracks. The first one we're gonna do is from your own band, Better Strangers. Yeah, so brace yourself, Genesis fans. I'm sorry, Ooh. we're gonna... <laughs> You're in for a treat. I don't even think I've heard this one. Well, it's actually, it's our upcoming single. It's our next single, which, I mean, hopefully we're, we're hoping to release it in the next couple of weeks, um, kind of finishing up all the, you know, the videos and the promo yeah. and everything around it. But yeah, so this is, um, this is a Better Strangers song. Nice, this is called Rain Check. Yeah.
<laughs> that song goes so hard. And a little bit of nine eight in there. Love it. Um, yeah, different, different change of pace from the Genesis. Yeah. Song. Anything else you want to leave the drum community with before we do the last track? No, I mean, you know, uh, it's been awesome going through all this material. So, um, you know, obviously the course will be dropping sometime, yep. and um, you know that'll be a really cool kind of thing to put out there. But also in the meantime, obviously you mentioned I'll be on tour with Mike and the Mechanics mm -hmm. uh, next year. And I've also got my own band, Better Strangers, you know. Go check them out. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> Shameless plug on the shirt. <laughs> Strategically chose to wear this today. Well played. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we're going to be coming out with some new music, um, you know, tapping into a bit more prog stuff now. Uh, not to get, you know, all the Genesis fans overly excited. But um, yeah, I think if you kind of like some of that stuff, um, you may like some of our stuff. So, you know, keep an eye out. Yeah, as you said, we're on Instagram, betterstrangers.wave. And um, yeah, that's nice, kind man. of my day to day life is with them. So yeah. I love it. Uh, so we're going to close out. This is a tongue, a, a tongue, a song from Tarzan. <laughs> and I found this really interesting when we talked to your dad because. I feel like a lot of people throw around Tarzan like, oh, it's like that's all they know your dad for mm -hmm. is that musical. And he talked about how that was one of the things that he's the most proud of of his entire music career. Yeah. And he spent, I think it was like five years on it or something. Yeah, I mean, the he for the the I remember him telling me that the amount of like he he was getting the movie as they were making it to write the songs based on the scenes and based on the storyline. It wasn't just like he had songs that they just used in Tarzan. Yeah. So you could tell like the amount of work that he put in on it. And then obviously when it went to Broadway and then it did, you know, it went to like the Broadway equivalent in Germany. So there was a lot of work that he put in, a few extra songs that he wrote. But yeah, like it is funny being, you know, because obviously now I've, you know, been going through his Genesis catalog, his yep. Brand X catalog, as well as obviously his solo stuff. It's just like a lot of people know my dad as either the Tarzan dude or the dude who did ba 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 you know. And so doing this has just been a great way to obviously kind of showcase some of the other stuff he did and and obviously for me going through it and realizing all the stuff the cool stuff he did because growing up I didn't experience Genesis really. I mean yeah. obviously they had the 2007 tour but I just knew my dad as the as the singer who kind of played drums in his set a little bit too. So yeah. going through this it's just like, you know, throughout the years it's just been like such a kind of crazy experience for me as well and seeing him in a band context when we started rehearsing yeah. with Genesis and being like, oh, you, like, you know, being in a band you're just like Oh, so you're you go through this as well. You're in yeah. a band with with like you know with other people. You're not the boss all the time. Yeah. And so yeah, it's just been a really kind of cool thing overall. Nice man. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you all so much for watching, and we'll be online again, I guess, on Monday. Nick, thanks so much for being here. And this is one of the best songs from Tarzan. Yep. They can